Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this online presentation of our paper on the security goals of white box cryptography. My name is Estuardo, and this is a joint work with Alessandro Amadori, Chris Brusca, and Will Michels. And as the title of our work says, um, we here deal with the white box attack scenario. And in the white box attack scenario, we consider software implementations of cryptographic algorithms, and we consider an adversary who might gain access to the implementation code of these algorithms and who might also be in, in control of the execution environment of the algorithm. So this gives the adversary the capability of ins inspecting the implementation code um, of uh, performing also uh, static or dynamic analysis, collecting input and output pairs, etc. And in white box cryptography, we aim to provide security even under such uh, strong attack threats. So in this paper, what we wanted to do, we wanted to clarify what exactly were the security goals of white box crypto, what, um, and, and uh, we wanted to understand them and, and clarify them as well. Uh, so, so we would ask ourselves, okay, what exactly should we expect from a white box program? Um, which security properties should it actually achieve? And as it turns out, it, uh, these security properties may vary a little bit depending on the use case that we're giving to white box crypto. So we started by analyzing and discussing the main use cases of white box cryptography, uh, this being mobile payment applications and DRM applications, and uh, understanding why exactly uh, is white box cryptography being used as a software protection technique within those, those applications. And in line of this, we um, uh, discuss and study uh, popular security notions which have been presented in the past for white box crypto. Um, this has been presented in the context of DRM applications. And uh, as we see, uh, they might not really be, uh, provide the security properties we desire for white box crypto when using it um, within mobile payment applications. Uh, so in line with this, we propose to focus on the security goals of hardware binding and application binding for protecting mobile payment applications for protecting um yeah for achieving security uh, against white box adversaries <clears throat> uh, in mobile payment applications and we provide a security definition for white box encryption programs with hardware binding so additionally we also present an impossibility result for general white box compilers so uh, in this case general white box compilers means a compiler which uh, from any secure symmetric encryption scheme can generate a white box secure uh, encryption scheme. So we present, we we show that such compilers cannot exist. Um, and I do not talk about this result on this presentation, but in case anybody is interested in that, we can of course talk about it afterwards. Um, so let's start by revisiting the main use cases of white box crypto in practice. Uh, for those who are not so familiar with it, so DRM and mobile payment applications. So when white box cryptography was introduced some, some years ago, it was introduced within the context of digital right management applications. And in DRM, what we have is uh, we have a content provider or here a broadcaster here. So this, this provider generates some content and uh, then encrypts it and then broadcasts it. So, and then we have a set of uh, users or uh, a set of subscribers who pay for this, for this service and uh, they, they obtain some decryption or some decoder algorithm which lets them uh, recover the information that is being, being broadcasted. So in this, in this example, a video streaming platform, for example. And we consider the case that some of these subscribers might want to use, uh, might want to misuse their decryption programs. So, so in this case, we we uh, have uh, subscribers who might maybe want to make copies of these programs and share it with other friends or other people who did not pay for the service. And we want to stop these other people from uh, accessing the content without having paid for it. So, so Whitebox Crypto should should um, somehow help to stop this. Uh, it should stop the user from extracting information from the programs that would let, let them um, recover the content uh, illegitimately or from copying the, the program and sharing it around. 
and uh, a bit more recently so white box crypto was uh, proposed as a as a technique for increasing the robustness of mobile payment applications and so mobile payment applications uh, they serve pretty much the same purpose of, as traditional credit cards they um, so what they do is they store these uh, limited use keys which are user specific keys they store them in encrypted form and whenever i want to perform a, a payment at any terminal of my choice what i do is i uh, recover one of these luks and then with this luk uh, i generate a, a transaction or a tra transaction request message and here the white box program consists of uh, this decryption and this encryption program uh, bound together and we consider an adversary in the form of malware which might find itself within the phone and might want to extract some information that would let him recover the LUKs and then use the LUKs on any for any payment of his choice or on any terminal of his choice. So now that we've uh, revisited these uh, two use cases, we might go back to the to the main question of what are the goals of white box cryptography? And um, it might be uh, it might be that we've so some of us might heard different answers to this question. Um, and here I discuss a little bit why uh, there might be different opinions on this. So so one uh, one thing we hear uh, frequently is that uh, the goal of white box crypto is uh, or white box cryptography is about hiding the key of a, of a cipher. And this is a natural line of thought because given the fact that the adversary gets access to an implementation uh, code of the cipher, uh, then it's, it's um, of course, we need to hide secret information like the decryption key, for instance, because otherwise if this key is leaked, then uh, we cannot expect any further security properties from this program. Um, but we should keep in mind that, that a white books program should still, besides, uh, besides hiding the key, it should also achieve basic security properties that we, wish, uh, that we usually wish from encryption programs, for instance, uh, one-wayness or um, confidentiality, for example. So another, another, um, another answer we might hear uh, sometimes is that a white box crypto is about um, hiding the key of AES implementations and in fact, this is this is a very difficult task, and it's a very important one uh, because AES is widely deployed, and also in the in the use cases I mentioned before, it is AES what's actually being used for for decrypting um, or encrypting. And um, and uh, um, we have seen based on on some evidence, like for instance, based on the white box competitions, that uh, hiding the key of AES implementations is indeed very difficult. Um, so, however, we should keep in mind that white box programs are also susceptible to code lifting attacks or redistribution attacks. These are the attacks where an adversary simply copies the complete white box program and then runs it on any device of his choice for whichever purposes he wants. So, in the DRM use case, we have this case where the, the user simply copies the complete decryption program, shares it wherever he wants, and without extracting any information from it, um, other users are able to, to recover uh, content. And if we go back to the, to the use case of mobile payment applications, we see that here uh, code lifting attacks are also a threat because an adversary might simply copy the complete payment application with the LUKs and then just run the application to recover the LUKs on any device of his choice and any payment terminal of his choice. So for mobile payment applications, a white box program should also achieve security against code lifting attacks. So now I'm going to talk about uh, popular mitigation techniques against code lifting attacks that were presented in the past within the context of white box, this being traceability and incompressibility. So I will describe these two properties in a bit, but uh, here, here I wanted to, to show that um, this, uh, based on these examples, that we have several works presenting uh, security definitions for um, incompressibility and traceability, and also constructions. Um, but it should be noted that uh, when this, these two properties were proposed, the main use case of white box crypto that was uh, used as a motivation was DRM applications. So we might ask ourselves, okay, um, 
are these properties also useful for protecting uh, mobile payment applications? So let's have a look and let's revisit what these properties are about. So traceability is about watermarking an encryption program. So in this case, a white box encryption program. And we watermark it with a specific tracing key. <clears throat> the idea is that if I make a copy of this program, that this copy will also have this tracing key embedded on it. And the idea is that if I find a, an illegal copy of this program somewhere in the black market, for example, that via this tracing key, I should be able to determine who uh, was the original owner of the program. And then I can find out if he's using the, his, his white box program for illegitimate purposes. So, so indeed, this, this seems um, a reasonable property for, um, for trying to control piracy in this sense. But if we go back to the mobile payment applications, we see that it might not really be that useful because, um, so first of all, the owner of the payment application is, a, is an honest user who wants to protect his, uh, his LU case here, his, his uh, user-specific secret information. Um, and uh, yeah, it's clear that, that the owner of this application is not gonna make illegal copies of it and share it around because he doesn't want anybody to, to recover his LU case. Um, so from this point of view, it doesn't seem like traceability is uh, really necessary uh, for mobile payment applications, or at least not in this way. Um, so now we can talk about incompressibility. And incompressibility is about uh, making programs of very large size. Um, and as soon as these programs are uh, compressed or fragments of the programs are removed, the program should lose its functionality. So here, what, what we do is uh, from a conventional encryption scheme or an encryption program, we derive uh, an incompressible white box encryption program of very large size. The idea of having very large size programs um, as a mitigation technique against code lifting is that such very large size programs should be difficult to transmit over the network, right? Because um, <clears throat> it should take a very long time to do that and this should make it very difficult for an adversary to perform a code lifting attack. Um, and when looking at the mobile payment application example, we again seem, um, we again see that this seems to stand a little bit in contrast with uh, how we are aiming to design applications running on mobile mobile devices, right? Uh, we're usually trying to, to design them in, in small sizes and so on. And of course, a white box program is not gonna be small sized, but it seems a bit uh, contradictory to uh, design the program on a very large size on purpose. Um, and moreover, uh, a very large size program, which is difficult to transmit over the network, is going to be difficult to transmit over the network. Also, in the case that uh, the honest user is downloading it, right? So, it's, so the distribution, the legal distribution of these programs, is also going to be affected by um, by its very large size. So, in addition to this, um, the property of incompressibility, unfortunately, does not capture any further. Um, security properties that we might want from white box programs, uh, besides, of course, incompressibility and security against key extraction. So uh, based on this, we propose to focus on the properties of, um, of hardware and application binding. Now I explain shortly what these properties are about. It's a bit intuitive from the name. So hardware binding is about having a white box program, which it's, uh, should only be executable in one specific device. So the idea is that whenever I try to perform an encryption, I should check if I am running on the specific device. So in this case, the device is identified by this delta value. So is, is delta present? And if it is, then I, it should output um, ciphertext. It should generate the ciphertext. And if not, it should just output uh, an error message. So, so um, yeah, if I try to run a copy of this program on a different device, it should always output an error message. Um, and application binding is a bit similar in the sense that the encryption program should only run on one, within one specific application. And more precisely, I should not be able to separate this program from the application. Um, so this can be useful in the case that the application is performing authentication operations. For instance, uh, it should try to authenticate me 
uh, asking for a password, for example, that only I know. And then if the password is correct, then the encryption can take place. So, so this, uh, we consider both of these properties useful for white post cryptography. Um, and uh, we present a definition of hardware binding for application binding. We face some issues when trying to define it, but I will talk about that later. But uh, yeah, first I will explain how we define hardware binding. So first uh, for defining hardware binding, we follow the approach uh, presented in this work uh, titled Security Reductions for White Box Key Storage in Mobile Payment. And in this work, the authors present uh, a security definition for white box KDFs with hardware binding and also for uh, white box mobile payment applications with hardware binding. And they define security in combination of a hardware module. So we, we follow this approach. Uh, we also use a hard, a, the same hardware module for defining security of white box encryption programs. So I explain here how, what this hardware module is about. So, so we consider um, a hardware device. Uh, so, so, so we have this hardware module. Uh, which is secure against uh, uh, wh white box adversaries, right? So, so here we have a secure master secret key, a hardware master secret key. And whenever we, we want to generate a program, a white box program that should run on this hardware, we query the hardware with a label value, which identifies the program we want to generate. And then based on this label value and based on the hardware master key, we will generate a hardware subkey. So then we uh, we will communicate this subkey to the entity that is going to compile our white box program. So we communicate this securely, and then we will compile this white box program uh, based on the symmetric key that we will use for encryption and based on this hardware subkey. This will generate the ENCHW, which is the um, white box encryption program and a querying algorithm. And uh, yeah, the query, uh, I will explain a little bit more about the querying algorithm in a second, but the idea is that for querying the hardware, uh, we will generate a query value based on the message we want to encrypt. Um, so now that we have the encryption program, we can run it on our device. And whenever we, we want to perform an, an encryption, we will first uh, generate the query value um, and then we, together with the label, we will query the hardware and then the hardware will generate a response value based on the query and on the label and on the master secret key, uh, hardware master key. Um, and it will, it will give back this response value, this sigma. And then our, our white box program should check for the validity of this sigma and, and if it's valid, then it should output um, it should output the, the ciphertext, see. So, and then the idea is that for a valid sigma value, our white box encryption program is functional equivalent to, to an encryption algorithm um, run using the key K that we used for compilation in the beginning. And uh, the idea of having a, the querying algorithm is that uh, we should recall that in the white box attack scenario, we usually have an adversary who is capable of intercepting the values that are coming to um, that are coming as input to the white box encryption program. So the idea we want to have um, we want to have a process on which uh, for each message that we want to encrypt, we should generate a, quer a different querying value and uh, thus also a different response value. So if an adversary intercepts the sigma, the, the response value, he can only use this response value for, um, for encrypting one specific uh, message. So, so he cannot just uh, copy one, uh, intercept one um, sigma, and then copy the encryption program, and then use it uh, for generating ci any ciphertext he wants. It will only be useful for generating one specific ciphertext and yeah, corresponding to one specific message. So now um, I, can, I can explain you how we define the security for white box encryption. So what we do is we give the adversary the white box encryption program and we give him also the querying algorithm and we give him access to a hardware oracle which generates responses. So this gives him, this gives the adversary the capability of experimenting a bit with the white box program, right? 
Um, so, and then the adversary continues to play a distinguishing game with an encryption, um, with an encryption oracle. So he queries it with two messages and then the oracle based on a, on a coin value will either, um, either encrypt M, M0 or M1 and then return the ciphertext. <clears throat> so, so yeah, the adversary should not be able to distinguish uh, which one of the two messages was encrypted. Uh, but the big difference here with uh, a traditional left or right game is that um, the adversary can only query uh, using messages that were not used for, so, sorry, the adversary can only query this oracle, this encryption oracle, using messages M0 and M1, which have not been used for querying the hardware oracle. So. So the idea is that the adversary is trying to, um, so, so the, the adversary should then obtain a ciphertext and then he should try to, he should try to distinguish either uh, based on the ciphertext itself or uh, by trying to run the encryption program without using the hardware. Um, yeah, so, so we capture the scenario where the adversary is trying to make himself independent of the hardware yeah and uh, it's similar with a decryption oracle that we see below there the adversary queries it with a with a ciphertext and the nonce um, and then we first recover the the message corresponding to that ciphertext and and if there haven't been any queries to the hardware based on that message then uh, the adversary proceeds to play this, this distinguishing game where if the bit value is one then um, the the oracle returns a, a zero, and if the bit value is um, if the bit value is a zero, then the oracle returns returns the message. Um, <clears throat> so so um, that's how we define the security of white books encryption. And uh, just to to wrap it up, I explain. Here, uh, what are some challenges that we face when defining uh, application binding? So, so first of all, it, it seems a little bit difficult to uh, define exactly what is an application. And when defining security for this, we need to consider all the things an application might do. So an alternative we thought about is um, defining security for specific applications, such as these applications performing authentication operations. However, there we also faced some issues um, so, so uh, the idea is that a, a user authenticates himself uh, with some password or some fingerprint, for example. But uh, we need to recall that these this values in this case are unique and a white box adversary might be able to intercept them. So, so in, in this case, it's difficult to, uh, to have a consistent definition because the, the, there's always the possibility of the adversary intercepting that one value and then um, and then running the the white box program. So we thought about um, having a definition where the white box adversary is a little bit weaker, so where he is not able to intercept the value. Uh, but here we also faced a couple of issues because so first of all this this was a bit inconsistent with how we usually consider the white box adversary. But second. Uh, is the fact that in order to define security, we need to consider long enough inputs, right? Long enough passwords, because otherwise the adversary can just uh, brute force them. Um, but when, when we're uh, considering such long enough inputs, uh, then we might as well just consider uh, a keyless white box implementation where the user stores the key somewhere secure and whenever he wants to perform an encryption or decryption, he just provides the key. So. Based on these issues, we, we uh, thought we decided to not present a, a security definition for application binding in this sense. So now just to conclude the, the talk. Um, so yeah, so as, as I recall, white box crypto needs to achieve more than, than only security against key extraction. So of course, that's a base uh, security goal, but it should achieve more like mitigating code lifting attacks. And uh, we we believe that hardware binding is a is a central uh, security property that white box programs sh should achieve. And as well, application binding we find very useful in real life applications in practice, 
Uh, however, it's a bit more difficult to define formally. And with this, I finish the talk and I thank you all very much for your attention.